Good morning. Good morning. So glad to be in the house of the Lord and speaking to you this morning. Thank you for the uh, privilege and the honor to speak uh, for this congregation. This week, early this week, we were driving home from school. I picked up Emmy from school and she stopped. She point blank came up with a question. She told me or asked me, Daddy, were you always shorter than Uncle Glenn? <laughs> so, you know, that's a very good question, Emmy. Because I was just thinking about using an illustration for my message that's coming up. So actually, when I took it from her, her polite way of saying, Daddy, were you always short? <laughs> and, uh, you know, that's, that's kind of what I'm thinking about this morning. But first off, let me ask you, are you excited about the upcoming football season? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. I heard some guys. You know, the guys are all going, yeah, yeah, football, you know, college, pro. Ladies are going, ah, oh, well, that's okay. It's something that we tolerate. Well, let me start today's message with a football story. Growing up, I remember, like, uh, being nine years old, I admired a football player named Johnny Rogers. Some of you might know him, if you're my older. He was a running back, wide receiver, pump returner for the Nebraska Court Huskers. 1972, he was the Heisman Trophy winner. Fast guy, short, fast, shifty, big touchdowns. So I admire this guy. I love playing football in the schoolyard. So being at 9 years old, 10 years old, I would want to play football in the schoolyard. So at recess, we'd gather, pick up games. I would be, always be one of the last to be selected. I was short, and I guess I was slow. So I was always one of the last to pick. And you know, I thought of myself as being fat, Johnny Rogers. But I didn't have the opportunity to prove myself to my friends. So you know, actually, I kind of started building a chip. I started getting more aggressive and straight, but in doing so, I had to prove myself, I became confrontational. There would be times when I would try to pick a fight with somebody, and that's not too wise. This fight usually ended up with me looking around for my friends and saying, pull me back, pull me back, because it was more of an rather than an actual threat to actually fight. And so I think I was one of the first guys to come up with, pull me back, pull me back, because I'm going to do some damage. So I thought of myself as a, a, a bulldog or a Dobert pincher, when in actuality, I was a little irritating chihuahua. <laughs> so all these things kind of started building. I was always small, slow like this. Starting in the 7th and 8th grade, now, at this time, a lot of my friends, Glenn, Uncle Glenn included, we are all Asian, so we're all about the same size. So in the schoolyard, we would play tackle football, kind of crazy. We would play tackle football, trying to push each other to the ground as hard as we could. But we are all the same size, so games were competitive. Now, in the 7th and 8th grade, I started to sprout up. So in actuality, I became taller than my friends. But we're of the Asian persuasion, so we're all relatively small. But relative to them, I was big. I was fast. And so I was really like basking in the sunlight of, wow, I get to be bigger than my friends. And I get to play football, basketball, other sports. In the eighth grade, we had the opportunity to play a flag football team from St. Joseph. So if you know, so St. Joseph is in Makawao. We were kind of like cross town rivals because we were in the same town. Makawao School, we had a lot of students compared to St. Joseph. So when we played this flag football game in Eddie Tad, we had like 20, 30 guys. And I think St. Joseph had lucky if they had 11 guys to make a team. So we formed this uh, organization just to play flag football between the schools. And again, we, we had guys that were like 
200 pounds, almost six feet tall. And those guys were our front line. That, the front line is the guys that can block. And they block for offensive play. Or they chase the other offense. Big guys, strong guys. Oh, I was about maybe five feet, 120 pounds. So I was one of the smaller guys. So we started playing and we actually were destroying St. Joseph. Our team was bigger, our team was faster, we had more guys, and it was in a way unfair to St. Joseph. Now, I didn't touch the ball too much. Uh, actually, I didn't touch the ball. But at one point, I saw my mom in the parking lot, in the car, waiting. And I didn't want her to wait. So I told the guys, hey guys, you know what? Can I touch the ball once? Because my mom's waiting there. And if I get to touch the ball once, then I'll have to go home with her. Not wanting to keep her waiting in the parking lot. So they said, okay, Eric, you can uh, get the ball on this next play. Five yard line, our own five yard line. They all line up. And the big guys in the front say, Eric, grab a hold of the back of my shirt and follow me. <laughs> okay, I'm not going to argue with this guy. So we snap the ball, five yard line, grab the shirt of the biggest guy. And then I just followed him, and, uh, and they just opened, like the Red Sea opened up, and I could run, run. Now, I think in my imagination, I was like Johnny Rogers, you know, I was like shifty and like, you know, pushing away all the, the St. Joseph players. Uh, I don't know, but what happened was I made a 95 yard touchdown on that one play, the single touch I had in the whole game. And then I had to say, oh, get my things, and I'm going home. Now, thinking about that, I was like, kind of in my mind, I was having visions of grandeur. I was like, hey, you know what, I'm getting bigger. Next year's high school, I can go for JV. I, I imagine myself as a small shifty running back. In high school, JV football, getting a chance to touch the football, score touchdowns. So, went through that, had these great visions of potential. And what happened was, we came back from summer break, all of us freshmen, freshmen from other schools, fed into Maui High School. So we had JV players ready to try out. You know what I noticed? That over the break, the friends that I was taller than, they were taller than me. And the guys that were 200 pounds, they're not even bigger, way bigger than me. They're probably like 250. And I was so dejected because I saw people growing bigger than me. So if I had to take a poll, I think I was shorter and smaller than 99% of the people or the boys that would have tried out for JV football. So nonetheless, common sense got the better of me. And I said, you know what? It's not wise for me to even set foot on that field with all these bigger guys. I'm going to get hurt. So from that point, a building of disappointment, dejection. Was I resigned? Yeah. So are these normal reactions for a situation like that, where we have visions of potential, but yet the reality of it is that we get back to her, bring back down, looking at the reality of our limitations. So. In admission, I was building a chip on my shoulder. A chip on your shoulder is definition to seem angry all the time because you think you have been treated unfairly or feel that you're not as good as other people. So, chip built up. Now, because this is football, I said, well, to better illustrate my state of mind, probably I'm going to need like two bags of chips and put it like this on my shoulder. Football pads, huh? So, throughout high school, throughout college years, my early college years, I, I was a very angry person inside. I don't think I took it out to people, my friends, maybe my family, no. But inside, I was very torn and, and confused and, and, and disappointed actually in myself. Praise God for I wish that I knew this when I knew. 
in college, Brother Glenn shared it with the love of Jesus. It's been a long, slow process, but Jesus' love has shown me the picture for my life. Jesus has surgically been removing those bags. My pride is what helped me. Thankfully, Jesus forgave Jesus to remove, remove those baggage, baggage, chips on the shoe. So I'm encouraged that Jesus is working on transforming me from a young, immature person to a representative of him on this earth. I've been encouraged in my walk. It's a competition. And today I'd like to share with you something that is maybe familiar to you. It's a prayer that was uh, composed or offered by Ryan Bookmaker. There's been some disagreement on whether he was the original author because there's potentially other writings prior to his publishing of this book. And so this work of art has given me encouragement. I'd like to share that. It's called the Serenity. Serenity prayer goes, God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, courage to change the things I can, and wisdom to know the difference. Living one day at a time, enjoying one moment at a time. Accepting hardships as the path of peace. Taking as he did the sinful world as it is, not as us. I would have it, trusting that he will make all things right. If I surrender to his will, that I may be reasonably happy in this life and supremely happy with him forever in the next. Now, this, this writing has, has really given me reminders of Jesus' love for me. And whatever I have, I will to him. He's saying, with this, we can come as we are. We can have surrender. We can have courage. And we can have wisdom. Now the first three lines of the, the the writing is, is the most popular. You know, you go to a Christian bookstore, you see the first three lines on these different plaques. And, and I, I really love it because that's this short snippet of words gives me a reminder of my gratitude to God. So first off, let's look at grant me the serenity. So by definition, serenity is to be serene, to be calm or tranquil. I see it as one who is at peace. So what can lead to this serenity? It, it, it obviously is a product of something. We're asking God to grant me serenity. So I believe that a contentment in Christ can lead to serenity in Christ. On Crosswalk.com I found an article by Jeff Robinson titled The Four Signs of Contentment. And in it, he writes, as fallen men, as fallen men, we even redeem fallen men, we will never be entirely content in life. Our hearts are too prone to wander, far too apt to flirt with idolatry for us to be completely content in Christ. Still, we pray for contentment, and like Paul in Philippians 4.11, we seek to learn the secret to contentment in Christ. So Mr. Robinson then continues that when my contentment is in Christ, four things should be true of me. So what happens when I'm content in Christ? So first, I would exhibit a deeper love for God's Word. So Mr. Robinson writes, because my contentment is in Him, I will want to know Him more. I know Him more through His Word. Contentment is a plant that must be tended daily. One of the primary means is by hiding His Word in our hearts and having it in our person as a constant reminder that apart from the Lord, we can do nothing. Number two, 
I will exhibit a deeper and more mature love for God. So he says, when our satisfaction, when your satisfaction is found in Christ, then you will want to be in His church and with His people. It will also transform the way you see the church. This building is not a church you are. And when your contentment is in Christ, you will love God's people, all of God's people, not just those people with whom you are comfortable. And you will love His church, even though it is imperfect and stained with sin. If I am content in Christ, then it will set me free from false expectations of others and will set me free to love people who come from a different background than I Next he says, I will not fall apart when adversity comes. Challenges. He says, I will write in the absolute sovereignty of God. Excuse me, I will rest in the absolute sovereignty of God and His prerogative. Because we are weak and lack omniscience, there will be many moments in life when we simply do not understand what is going on. There will be times when we all, when all you have is Christ. But if you are content in Him, He will be enough. Finally, it says, I will want others to know the great gain that comes from godliness with contentment. I will want my friends, neighbors, and family members to find a peace that passes understanding. So then he closes the article, he says, I have written this series not because I am content or am an expert in the doctrine of contentment. Actually, I have written this because I am an expert in discontentment. And I am seeking contentment in Christ. May it please God. There you see where contentment in Christ can lead to serenity. Serenity is the product of contentment, other positive attitudes that Jesus is So next, courage. God grant me the courage to change things that can. So do we have a boldness in Christ? When we were walking with Him, does He give us a boldness? Know that we're representing, we're representing Jesus on this earth. And then when we look in the mirror, do we have a glimmer of Jesus in ourselves? <coughs> so be encouraged that all believers are works in progress. And that the process of sanctification to become Christ-like is part of our walk. Next, the wisdom to know the difference. <coughs> so the question is, what can I change and what can I not change? So looking back at my growing years, could I have changed my height? That's why I began this this talk with the question, am I blank enough? So for me, the question might have been, am I tall? And I'm sure all of us have come across that question once in our life, where we saw ourselves as maybe insufficient. Insufficient. So that blank can be many different types of adjectives for our thoughts and our images of ourselves. But Jesus said, just come as you are. Tall, short, young, old, fast, slow. Now, I was thinking, what can I do to kind of go through this? And one of the, the issues that I mentioned in my last talk was my challenge to discern God's will versus my will. So I pulled up another <coughs> excuse me, definition of discern. So this word is to be able to see, recognize, understand, or decide something. So last time I was mentioning my challenges in discerning God's will versus my will. Now being that tomorrow is Labor Day, labor stands for work. All of us adults, we work. I decided to try to look at my work career for 
looking at it as an example of discerning, or maybe lack of discerning. So I've been working a little over 37 years. Um, I started working part-time uh, at 15, and I've had various part-time and full-time jobs in those 37 years. Now in those 37 years, I've had approximately 30 jobs. Uh, I don't know whether I should be proud of that or ashamed of having 30 jobs. But you know, if you look at my resume, oh boy, that's not a really a good reflection of stability if you uh, <laughs> look at my resume. So those, those jobs uh, range from Pohana game, you know, pulling weeds in the pineapple field, pineapple picker, truck driver, uh, I was a yard man at school. Um, I, I was given two hours for my talk, so I'm going to probably have to go through every one in detail, so uh, bear with me. But I was an engineer, instructor, uh, computer tech, etc. So we might need more than one sermon to cover my, my career. Well, these jobs. sums up to my current career up to this point. So how would you sum up my career? I probably can just relay this, this saying that I, I come home. When I come home from work, a lot of times, the majority of the times, my loving wife comes to the door and says, how was your day at work? And my usual saying is, work is work. Doesn't sound too positive, yeah? Work is work. And that's why I love our, our walk through Ecclesiastes that Pastor Josh talked about. He talked about you know, the wisdom of Solomon and, and his toils under the sun. Solomon toiling under the sun. And, and that's what it is, people. Work is work. But we have the opportunity as believers to do something more with work than work. Right? You have to agree with that. So the opportunities, there's been times when because of uh, maybe the work situation I'm in, there's been youth that have approached the company for internships and, and, and in that case, I've had the opportunity to speak to you about work and my career. And um, I usually have some sayings, you know, wise sayings from this elderly guy that says, uh, you know, work and give them all kind of attitudes of, of wisdom. One of them is, my work career is a bumper sticker, and it says, don't follow me, I'm lost. Another one of my wisdoms is, don't follow my career because I don't know what I want to do when I grow up. Now, sometimes I can display some true wisdom maybe, and I tell you, I say, you know, for you to have success in life, you need to find your passion and your talent. And I, I think that's true. If you can find a livelihood that matches your passion, and your talent, I think you can thrive with that kind of environment. <coughs> but I realize in some way that is mistaken. I once heard a white pastor say, one should not think of what they want to do, but they should think of who they want to be. And as believers, that has a solid statement for us. Meaning, what can I do for my profession? Choose a profession, be successful, and so forth. But more importantly, our character in work is who do we want to be? What kind of worker are we going to be? Regardless of what type of job we have. That's really a spoken me in my heart and head about my approach to my work, the current work I'm in, 
and looking back at maybe mistakes I made in my former job. So looking back at my work, work career, I'm thankful for God because He opened doors and He closed doors. In all the jobs that I've had, I've had opportunity. There were some times when I pursued an open door because of financial reasons. The job offer could take, very attractive. So I pursued it. Looking back, a lot of those times, those financial pursuits came at a cost. There were maybe challenges to the job. There was maybe more pressure, more time requirement. Maybe the job entailed doing things that was not to my belief. And so, in my career, discerning God's will for my life has been a challenge. A lot of times, maybe, I say, oh, God wants to bless me. Look at this job. Great job, good pay. I'm going to take it. I'm going to take it. Get into the job, and it doesn't turn out to be as I expected. Looking back, I'll say, thank you God for giving me that opportunity. And I see where maybe I took my desires, my will, through that open door, and God taught me a lesson. And it was a hard lesson. It was a lesson of maybe pain and suffering. And maybe my own pursuits, my selfish pursuits, led to a downfall. So a lot of times my life has been a challenge to discern God's will versus my will in my professional And so discern, discern all of us. All of us have the opportunity to seek God's will through His word, through His teaching. How to thrive in a work environment. And that's where I am challenged to discern daily as I go to work. Lord, how do you want me to work for you versus maybe working for a company? Because what higher calling is it to work for God than to even work for an organization? So if we work for God, we have the opportunity to follow His will for our life. For an endeavor that takes one third of a life, if you think about it, eight hours a day is one third of your life is at work. So the serenity prayer is a good has been a good reminder for me of God's love and caring for me. So here are some words of truth and encouragement. We're getting it from the Bible, so these scriptures carry a lot of weight. And these scriptures serve as a basis for the serenity prayer. So first is, and the peace of God which surpasses every thought will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Philippians 4. Verse 7. Then Jesus said, Come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, let me teach you. Because I am humble and gentle at heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy to bear, and the burden I give you is light. Matthew 11, verses 28. Then the Apostle Paul writes, I don't say this out of need, for I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am. I know both how to have a little, how to have a lot, in any and all circumstances. I have learned the secret of being content, whether well-fed or hungry, whether in abundance or in need. I am able to do all things to him. Philippians 4. So my question for you today is, have you ever felt disappointed? Have you ever felt insufficient? 
Or have you ever felt being treated fairly? Just know that Jesus can provide love. He can provide. He can comfort. For in the past, let's not have thoughts of regret. But let's have prayers of gratitude. For our present, in Christ Jesus, every day is a new day of a new life filled with hope. Jesus is for the here, now, and future. He came to earth, died, and was resurrected so that we may have an abundant life in Him in which we thrive and have fellowship. But the life of Jesus Christ, every day is a new day. It's filled. We don't need to ask the question, am I blank? We can come as we are. Jesus is waiting there. Taking it as we are. We just have to approach Him and surrender our lives. So are you ready? Are you ready to get God's serenity? To get God's courage? Yeah.